The man you're looking at is a person I got to know just, what, about, about six months ago, something like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe eight months ago. It was during the summer. <laughs> yeah. It was during last summer. And um, uh, he was, you were the greatest thing that's happened in my life recently. Oh, my God. Because uh, you're all kinds of things. You're a teacher. You have history. <laughs> and I want to tell people, the person you're looking at is named Jack Garfine. And Jack has had a rather illustrious career in theater and film. Uh, and, uh, you know, the stories he can tell about that are <laughs> many. But it's like you led two lives. If we were to make a movie of your life, there would be two sections to it. And so I want to get to the first section today, okay? Okay. Where were you born? What? Where were you born? I was born in, at the time it was Czechoslovakia, a city called Mukachevo in the Carpathian Mountains. Wow. <coughs> the Carpathian Mountains, one tends to think of Dracula. Well, I think of Gogol who said, in the mountains there were these monsters that, you know, when the earth was created, they're buried there, and not buried, they live in the mountains. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting because as a kid, I used to be a f kind of f afraid, I didn't know the story. I was so afraid of the mountains. And when I read Gogol, I, I understood what yes. was going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and your father did what? Was he, what My he... father was born, well, my mother was born the same. She was born in Austria-Hungary at the time. Yeah. And my father, too, was Austria-Hungary at the time, before Czechoslovakia was formed. Wow. And, uh, and my father was uh, one of the probably formed a Zionist organization mm -hmm. in Czechoslovakia. He knew, as a young man, he knew that the only solution for the Jews was to go to Palestine. You know, that was called Palestine right. at the time. And... Uh, he would go to uh, very poor Jews in the mountains who, you know, had hardly ever seen anybody and outside. And he would tell them that, you know, they knew the story of olden times about Moses and would you like to go back there? And of course they said, yes. He said, well, you have to do certain things to get back there. And he was a young man, he was like 19 or 20. And then he organized the Zionist organization there. And when he got married, the Zionist organization of Czechoslovakia inscribed him in Israel in the Sefer Zahav, in the Golden Book. But, uh, and then his job, his father had a lumber mill. And when his father died, he ran it anyway, but he took, it, took over the lumber mill and um, and that was his income, but right. and the most important to him was mm -hmm. that the great sense of humor because he was trying to get us to go to Palestine. Mm -hmm. but, and my mother, whose family was very wealthy, and you know they had vineyards in Mukachevo, not in, in, in the Carpathian Mountains, not in the, in the Slovak part where, we were, yeah. where my father came from. And, uh, and she didn't want to go because, and he used to make fun. He used to say, well, because your father is putting on a new steel roof over the hotel. And so you, and you're afraid about your inheritance. <laughs> and this is why you didn't want to go. And I remember even as a kid, I used yeah. to hear him make fun of it, you know. Yeah. Did you, uh, did you have brothers and sisters? Yes, I had one sister. One sister. Yeah. Uh, now, it, it, this is this is where it all gets kind of interesting. Uh, not that you you know where you grew up wasn't interesting, but uh, you wound up in concentration camps. Yeah, and I, it, can you lead me into how that happened? Your remembrance of what was happening at the time that you that you did this? Well, actually, you know? uh, Alex, this is. A a bad time for me right now. Yeah. Between uh, the first night of Seder. Passover. Passover, yeah. Seder, until April 23rd, 
a very, I think part of my physical problem and my health, I think it also has to do with that. It's um, because I was a kid. I was 13 years old. Mm -hmm. And you know, when a, when a society mistreats a family or, or a people, the kids always think of their parents. They think yeah. their parents are supposed to protect them. They blame their parents. They don't say that. Right. But that's who they blame yeah. for be having the problem. And, uh, <coughs> and what happened was that um, I sensed already mm -hmm. what I, in Slovakia, because it started first there, you know. Mm -hmm. I think the Slovak Jews were the first one to be deported to Auschwitz, okay? And um, we were told at one point that uh, we had to be ready by a certain date. You could take so much sugar, so much clothes with you, and we're going to a labor camp, okay? And well, but wait a minute, let me, let's back up just a little bit. I'm, uh, because I was yeah. brought up in Slovakia, this is yeah. my hometown. Yeah. So there, the first Jewish laws came in there. Oh, okay, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah, yeah. About. And they, so we were supposed to, at certain points, be outside. Now, the reason I'm here and I'm able to talk to you is because my mother was amazing, absolutely amazing. Well, her family is very wealthy, so they were arranging for they bribed the entire customs department in Michalovce, the city, mm -hmm. on the border with Hungary. Right. Yeah, it was supposedly, you know what that was, like $10,000. You know what that was during yeah, the Yeah, well, war. that's... Right. <laughs> and he had a vineyard. He sold the most expensive wines in order to, to do that. And the idea was they were going to arrest my mother on the charge of dealing in foreign currency. And they were going to explain to the Slovak fascists that they needed her for the trial. They couldn't deport her. And after the trial, they would release her and they could deport her. And so uh, what happened was I was then 12 years old, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and my father, who was the head of the Jewish community, of, uh, but of the, of the reformed liberal part, right. so he had... Uh, an idea. What he did was he organized the young people, and he would he was getting the Slovak army. Mm -hmm. They would permit them to get some uh, uh, weapons, and what he was going to do because they said they're going to labor camp. He wasn't sure, but during the time of preparation, he would find out what was going on. But we were not going to go. He was going to get the young people to fight would have been the only city yeah. that would have rebelled against deportation, you know? So, so your father knew what was happening. He knew what labor camps meant. He, he, did he yeah. know that it was, uh, that there was going to be an extermination of the Jews? No, or no. they were just trying to separate no, the, the Jews from you know, the rest of the population? I don't think he thought of extermination, but he thought uh, in Poland they, they, you know, killed Jews. And word came back, for example... Uh, the most awful story was that I remember is that they uh, lined up the Jews, had them dig their own graves, families, women, men, women, and children, lined them up, mm -hmm. and they ran out of bullets. So they had them wait until the next morning. They had them all stand there, wait until they came back and had the bullets and they could kill them. You know? mm -hmm. And what happened was that uh, my father had heard the stories, and particularly my mother, because mm -hmm. people didn't believe it. They thought, oh, the Germans, Goethe, you know, Schiller, this is not a country uh, that would do things like that. This is, they thought it was communist propaganda, yeah. you know. And so my mother went and called a, a women's meeting and said to them, now listen here. She said, she told them what was happening in Poland. And they, they went hysterical. And so the, ortho, the head of the Orthodox community, yeah. who was the overhead, 
He right. was the, the over the important guy. Mm -hmm. Called my father in and said, what is your woman doing? Getting the women hysterical, make stories about, uh, about the Jews being killed like that in Poland and so on. And my father said, well, uh, my, my wife is um, like the heroine in Troy with the Greeks mm -hmm. who predict, oh. predicted the Trojans yeah. that it's not in prayer. I forgot, can't think of her name now. Huh. And the Orthodox rabbi never heard of her. He said, who is that? What are you talking about? Well, she told the ancient people, the Trojans, it's not in prayer and in all that. You better do things because you're going to get... My, my wife is like that. She knows. Right. Right? So uh, what happened was he organized a rebellion during this time. And we were on... And they believed it. So instead of being deported, the whole town was put under, um, you know... Well, you can't go in and out. Right. It was ghettoized. It was uh, under... Yeah, we, yeah. It was locked up. Yeah. And we all had to go get shots. Because what he did was, he got volunteers, young people who volunteered, yeah. to take typhus shots. And they took typhus shots. And then he said, it's a typhus epidemic. You can't take, it, they can't take anybody. Oh, out. okay. And he... Uh, and so they... The the but how did it come to be? Let's, what? How did it come to be that you were rounded up and sent away to the camps? How did it come to be that you got rounded up and sent away to the camps? Obviously, your mother's family, well, family money I'll, didn't. I'll tell do you it. what happened. Yeah. So what happened was, uh, uh, my father. We were on our way to get the shots when a young man who worked for the Jewish organization came running and said they arrested the head of the religious leaders and they're looking for you because somebody told the authorities that this was, this was all set up by you and the mm -hmm. other guy. So we need a leader. So we want you to go to Hungary. And he turned to us and my, mo my mother said, go, 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 you know. And so they, he left. And because they thought they didn't believe anything was going to happen, they thought they were going to get him back because they needed a leader, you know. Mm -hmm. And so um, he so he went to Hungary, and immediately they decided the Slovak fascist the deportations, okay? And the, the priests were the ones in charge of the deportation. Wow. I found a picture, which I'm going to send to the Pope, of the priest in my local town with a deportation committee, you know, because they took over, the head of the government was a priest yeah. and the entire parliament, and they voted for the expulsion of the Jews, except for three priests who walked out, who wouldn't agree, you know. Mm -hmm. And the idea was, guess what? They paid the Nazis 500 marks for every man, woman, and child that would be taken out with the idea that they would never come back to take them out, okay? So my grandfather then in Hungary arranged for us to, uh, you know, to the uh, 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 customs guys, that they would pick up my mother and they would put her in jail and they would arrange, my grandfather would arrange for a smuggler to get her out of jail and get, take her across to Hungary. Okay? So guess what, Alex? What? They're waiting, they can't come into town. And I, I was 12, but I was very jealous because my mother was very beautiful, you know. At age of 18, they said she was the most beautiful girl in the Carpathian Mountains. And a reporter came from Prague he said, I want to see the most beautiful girl in Prague. And then he wrote in the Prague paper, she's not the most beautiful in the Carpathian Mountains. She's the most beautiful in Czechoslovakia. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, what happened was that, that, uh, that we were then in two days, we were, and I was very jealous, you know, I thought because I saw her talking to men and 
secretly. And then one time we were packing mm -hmm. sugar, butter, and then and it was like uh, in two days or the next day, we were supposed to be in front of our house and be taken, you know, and go to the labor, go to the train station, right? And be taken to labor camp. So, what do I see? I see my mother talking secretly to a guy in in the entryway of the building, and my sister was, I was uh, twelve, she was nine. And I said, oh, you know, mother. She said, don't be stupid. She loves Papa. She, what are you talking about, you know? And I said, oh, yeah. Now, guess what? Then the next thing she tells us the next day, went one day ahead before the deportation, okay, pack these things, take care of this, and I'll be, I'll be back, you know? So she leaves. I decide to secretly follow her, right? My sister tries to stop me, but I um, find her. Mm -hmm. So just to show you, life goes on regardless of what happens, you know? Yeah. And so, so I followed, uh, we had a huge garden, and, and I hid behind the, the shed, woodshed. Mm -hmm. And what do I see? A guy in the garden fence suddenly raises his head. He's climbing up. And he notices me. Watch you there, he says to my mother. Who's that? Something like that. She comes running. She says, now you listen to me. I'm going to break your head. You understand? You get in the kitchen. I don't want you out here at all. Right? So I headed to the kitchen, but I didn't. I, I hid behind the chicken coop. Yeah, well, what was this meeting she was having? Yeah, I, well, I felt it was a rendezvous. This, <laughs> this is a proof yeah. that she's interested in another well, man. She was the most beautiful woman in the Carpathian yeah, 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 Mountain, yeah, yeah, after yeah, all. Right. Also the fact that, you know, yeah. that I was a boy, young kid at that yeah. point, and, you know, and my father wasn't around, and and shows you that, <laughs> aside from all that, the human element of jealousy, all that. Yeah. So, uh, so I, so then I hid, and she noticed, me. and she came running up, and I disappeared in the kitchen. Okay. Afterwards, she comes into the kitchen. She says to me, "Now you listen. Now you listen to me. There's a war going on, and if I tell you to do something, you're to do it. And what you did now, you endangered us. Okay." Don't you ever do anything like that. And she said to me, now lock the door. Give me the key. So I locked the door. She says, okay, kid, children. Uh, these people are supposed to, we're supposed to deport her tomorrow to labor camps. I don't believe it. And you know, uh, Madeleine Albright, when I told her the story, mm -hmm. she just thought it was the amazing story she ever heard. Because my sister is nine, I'm 12, right? She turns to me and my sister and says, now, your grandfather, that's so I met the man, the grandfather arranged in the gypsy camp. The customs guy cannot come into the town. It's all locked up. So we have to walk to the gypsy camp. And there they will be with a car and take us to, 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 the city, Michalovce, where they had their department. And I said, but Mama, they, they said any Jew on the street, if she's seen, would be shot immediately. You know what she said? To a nine-year-old and 12-year-old, that's what Madeleine Albright couldn't get over it. She said, children, I think that death is better than what they're going to face in the cattle car. And this nobody knew about. So how did it come to pass that you wound up being getting deported, that you wound up in those cattle cars? But, what? That you wound up no, no, going wait. to the camps. So, so we walk, and in the square are the guys with machine guns. And the guy who has the, the candy store, there was a Jewish candy store that he took over, 
He obviously knew us. He sees us. Guess what this woman did? He goes up to one of the fascist soldiers with a gun and says, listen, my husband is in a war. Oh, we had to tear off us. We tore off our stars. Mm-hmm. Um, in the war, I'm going to have a party on Sunday. I want you to come to the house and invite the guys. And she takes out a paper to write the address. So the guy thought, well, she must have a paper, something legal, because he was about to say, hey, Jews, you know. And so the guy said, took it, right? We get out of the square. And I said, but how come we're lucky? And my friends, all those people, lucky because your grandfather is rich, has a lot of money. She was always very straight and clean. Now, we get to the car. There are three other Jews that are there. The customs guy. What? Children? We never made that deal. How are we going to be stopped to check things? You're going to say they got a deal in currency? You're out of your mind. And the other Jews do said, Mrs. Garfine, please, please, you can't do that. And they said to the, the two customs guys said, uh, you, you, uh, you have to take the children back. We can't do this. We're all in danger if we do that. You know what my mother did? Amazing. Yeah. You want to know about a heroine? She said, look, I told my children what is happening. They're prepared to die. So what I want you to do is if we can't go with you, you have guns. You kill us, and I'll write a paper making you totally exempt that I asked for this. You did it purely on my urging. And then my kids are prepared to take it. Well, I wasn't. My thought was, I'm going to run. If they're going to kill me, fine. But I'm not going to stay and wait for them for them to kill me. So the two guys go off to the side, they talk, and they come up with the idea that we're gonna go in a, at that time, the European cars, the back baggage part was not in the back, it was under the back seat, mm-hmm. you know. So they said, okay, we can put the kids in the back seat, two screwdrivers on the edge, there. but the moment we stop for a checkup, you gotta take the screwdrivers out and take a risk that I can have any air, and then put it back after we move. Mm-hmm. And uh, my mother, again, look at her. You know what she did? She had two lemons that she brought. And she said, OK, here are two lemons. When you're in there and you feel out of breath, or things just squeeze the juice into your mouth, OK? And so uh, I never told this story, by the way officially to anybody. And um, so we were put under the seat, and at one point we were stopped. And they put the screwdrivers out, and the guards had a dog. And the dog kept trying to bar, it kept going the back seat there. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, the, the, the soldiers with the dogs said, oh, they're after the Jews, because they saw my mother and the others sitting there. Yeah. So he said, they're barking because of the Jews, right? Anyway, so we arrive in the prison, okay? The warden comes out. What? Kids? Are you out of your mind? What is this? Where do we put them? And then he said, I... Uh, and so my mother said, took off a ring that she had. I think it was her engagement ring gave it to the warden and said, please, let's find a way to do this. Well, I can't, I can't what can I do? One of the, one of the uh, customs guys said, well, I'll tell you what, my mother always wanted me to have kids. I don't have any. So I'm gonna take the two of them home. I think my mother's gonna be thrilled. So nothing to worry about, okay? And so uh, my mother goes off to jail, and uh, he, we get in the car, he, he comes to this outside peasant's house, and he said, I never forget this, 
Mama, I have a big surprise for you, right? She comes out and she says, children, those want to have kids? Here they are, look at that. And then uh, she understood right away what something was going on. Anyway, so the first thing is she made sure we were washed, we were cleaned, we were, you know, and make, and then showed us the room where we were going to sleep. And there are huge pictures of Jesus, of Mary. Of <laughs> and, I, and my sister said, how can I say prayers in front of this? I said, she told my mother the story. She said, Yankush, that's what they call me. Yeah, yeah. He's very smart. Yeah. Because I said to her, they understood those prayers. They were Jews, so don't worry. <laughs> I said, you can say the prayers. They were both Jews. Right? So for the time, for the time you're, you're kind of safe, would you say? What? Was that, were you safe at that, at that moment? Did you feel that you were kind of safe? Well, I was worried because I wasn't with my mother, but we felt, we felt safe. Yeah. And then, so then the arrangement was made mm -hmm. for us to leave and, you know, smuggle across the border. If we were caught, they would shoot us, you know. So my mother sent word that everything was ready. We would meet in this part of the forest and we go, and um, uh, the woman, the, the, pe the mother, mm -hmm. she said, well, why doesn't my sister stay? Because I was circumcised, there may be problems, but with her, she could stay as a non-Jewish girl, right? Mm -hmm. And my mother sent word, please stay, stay with them, and don't worry, we'll get you after the war. You know what she said? Nine years old. As a, as a Jew, I was born. And as a Jew, I will die. This is a nine year old kid. <laughs> but we were leaving. The mother went up to my sister and said, you remind me of our saints. You could be like our saint because mm -hmm. the first day when she made dinner, my sister wouldn't eat because she wants to buy. I had this isn't kosher. And I was kicking her under the table and saying, stop it, you know. And the, and I was eating, <laughs> and uh, she said, she, so the woman said, well, they didn't understand. So she said, I can't mix meat with milk, and I can't eat meat, it's not kosher. And, and she said, well, I'll put it separately in you know, the dishes. The next day, the woman went and bought a whole set of dishes for my sister, and only served her dairy. Anyway, so then came the night that we were going to the forest, and he, the custom guy, drove us to that part of the forest, and we saw my mother. My mother took out some money to pay him. He said, no, no, you don't pay me anything. You wouldn't take anything. You know, it just shows you human beings, right? Exactly why I did a play in Paris a few years ago, the Kafka play, which, because it's called an address to the academy, and it's an ape, an ape that became human. Mm -hmm. And at the end, I found an epilogue, which no one knew existed. And in the epilogue, he's in a hotel after he addresses the academy. And a fan walks in, you know, looking at you, I never knew you were ape, you're completely human. And he says, takes him. There's a smell over here. Opens his shirt. The guy says, well, I can't smell anything except humanity, but you, because of your background, you probably have a smell. He says, I hate humanity. Not individual human beings, mm -hmm. but humanity I hate. Right? And this is kind of the lesson you learned through and this, this whole is, process. I, this is 
when I did when I read this now in Paris, I said, that's my life. Yeah. Right. Always said individuals like that peasant woman. And as we go along with the story, we'll see where there are individuals. What? As we go along with the story, we'll see there are individuals yeah, yes, yes, yes. who, who, who uh, absolutely. were exemplary. Absolutely. And yet, and, and not the people that the, uh, that the audience here is expecting. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Mean, yeah. Not, uh, and, uh, but let, let's, why don't we take a, a, a small break? You what? Know, why don't we just take some time out here for a second, and we'll take a break, and uh, we'll continue this soon. So where we left off was you, you met up with your mother, did you, in yeah, the forest? Yeah, yeah, and we started the right. crossing. And at what point did you, I mean, at some point you had to get caught, right? Oh, I'll tell you. <laughs> we didn't get caught. It was amazing. First of all, again, children. You realize, you don't, yeah. people always tell horror about the stories, but never about the life. Yeah. So my mother was very protective of my sister. She was nine years old. So we had to at one point pass a farm where the, the, the awful stuff from the cows and the hood were, yeah. you know. Manure. Manure. Yeah. And she picked up my sister and carried her across. And for me, she said, walk. And I wouldn't walk. And so the people got worried. I said, no, you pick me up. She said, I can't pick you up, you, you know. So one of the people, one of the Jews, came and picked me up and carried me across. And then I felt she was protecting my sister. She preferred her to me, mm -hmm. okay. And uh, then at one point, the moment there was a sound, mm -hmm. We had to hide. We lay down flat because if the soldiers at the border saw us, they'd kill us. So anyway, uh, I was asked to go at the end of the line because I was the only kid, the boy, mm -hmm. and my sister went with my mother holding mm -hmm. hands. So guess what I did? At one point, I stopped. I said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to stay right here. And the, the guy, the, the guy who was leading, the smuggler, said, let's go. We just go. They went. I sat there. And I said, no, I'm staying. And, and so he came back, the smuggler, with my mother and my sister. And he said, now, I'll tell you what. I'm going to count 10. You don't go. You stay right here. And my mother pleaded with me, you know. I said, no, I'm not going. You go with her. In fact, I mean, it shows you under all this, the, yeah. the, you know, the human element, right? Yeah. And so I, um, they left again because I wouldn't move. Then my mother came back with tears, crying, and told me how much she loved me. <laughs> And then I went. And we got to the border of Hungary. And there, the smuggler said, OK, now you're on your own. It's pretty clear here. It's only farms, peasants. But dogs will be barking. Don't pay any attention. Just keep running until you get to the other part of the forest. And somebody will pick you up over there and take you to your family, okay? So we get to the edge and uh, said, just keep running and don't stop for dogs and don't be worried that the dogs will come and get you, okay? So we started, we ran, and this time my mother held my hand and I even said, no, no, I can make it, you know? And, uh, and we got to the other part of the forest and we were, sleeping, because it all happened during the night, uh, me, me and my sister. And there were terrible mosquitoes that bit us all over. And my mother had to stay up to watch for a carriage, horse and carriage, 
that was going to pick us up, you know, to take us mm -hmm. to the city. And so at one point she woke us and said, the horse and carriage is here. We go quietly. So we went and said, please, the moment it stops, act like you're sleeping. Because we couldn't speak Hungarian. My mother could speak it. She was worried, mm -hmm. you know. And so we went, we were in the carriage, and he took us to a hotel, okay? And out of the hotel, arrangements were made for us to be taken to the train station the next day, okay? And, uh, and here's the irony. The hotel was owned by a Jew. And in Hungary, the law was for Jews, if you kept refugees, you would be deported with the refugees. He found out that we were Jews. He said, okay, you get out, or else I report you to the police, okay? I mean, look at the peasant woman, and look at this guy. Yeah. Uh, and so um, we had to quickly pack, you know, and get in a horse and carriage and get near the railroad station, stay in the carriage until we, the train came. And then we got on the train and both of us, my mother told us, lie down like you're asleep. And because uh, on the train they came to check. Yeah. And she spoke perfect Hungarian. By the way, can I just ask you a second? Where was your father in all of this? My father was still in Hungary. In Hungary, okay. Yeah, in hiding, you know. Yeah. And so, I, uh, so I heard them opening the door, my mother speaking to them, and they didn't seem to wake us as kids, you know. And, uh, and we arrived in Munkac, where she was born, and mm -hmm. my maternal part of the family, my father, and there, one of my uncles was there again with horse and carriage and, uh, and drove us to the house, to the, in a big hotel. My grandfather owned a big hotel there, mm -hmm. and in the back were the living quarters. And we got to the thing, and, and my grandmother got emotional. My grandfather said, stop it. You never know who might see something just act like it's a normal kind of a visit. And we were all mosquito bitten all over, you know. And so they arranged for us to be in hiding, like Anne Frank, you know, mm -hmm. in the attic upstairs. They arranged for, you know, because my sister picked up Hungarian pretty quickly, but not me. It took me time, you know, and mm -hmm. I couldn't be downstairs or anything. And, um, and so we lived in the attic, so you couldn't see where the entrance was. How long were you there? Oh, almost a year, I think. In the attic? Yeah, but they would feed us, they would take care of yeah, well, us. Well, I know that, but I mean, I yeah, assume yeah. that, but, 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 yeah, yeah. but yeah. in the Maybe attic? Maybe not quite a year, but pretty close. In the attic, wow. Yeah, and then what happened was, one of my uncles, because my mother was born there, and, I, and luckily, both of us were born there as well. Both kids were born in, in my mother's town. It was, you know. Now this hotel and the attic were, were where again? There was no hotel, this was uh, my the, grandfather's. Okay, his, yeah. uh, his. Place, the hotel was his. Place. Yeah, uh, but the attic. Uh, was in his house. And that was where again? In, it, in the back. Where but in house. Czechoslovakia? No, no, oh. this is Hungary. Now, now you're in this Hungary. Okay, all right, all right. Yeah. I'm trying to, I'm trying and, to figure um, out the... So you went from Czechoslovakia to Hungary? From Slovakia. Slovakia. Czech didn't exist anymore. Okay. The Germans took Bohemia. Yeah. And so... Uh, um, so how, how did it come to pass? Uh, this is a year now so, in this attic. How did it come to pass that you suddenly got caught? Oh, well, what happened was my uncle got my, our birth certificates, which said that we were born there. Mm -hmm. So, and the idea was that my mother divorced my father and moved back to her hometown. Yeah. But she was, you know, 
Maybe it wasn't a year, maybe it was six months or something. Yeah. And so based on that, we were able to then come downstairs. But any time somebody saw something, we were always immediately hidden because people say, where did the kids come from? Yeah. Never saw them here before. And then it was time for my bar mitzvah. And uh, my grandfather said, hey, we gotta, I, had the, uh, I had the prophet Isaiah, okay? But you know, there was a lot of sexual stuff going on with the housekeeper in the hotel. And, I would always listen and <laughs> the story, and my mother would go after me and say, I, don't you go near there, though, you know. And so <laughs> one day I remember uh, I was listening to this guy who had two women and all, all that, and my mother uh, came in to the other room, but I was listening behind the door, and I said, and I started to recite Isaiah. She said, I'll give you an Isaiah. You, I know what you were doing here. I warned you never to do this, right? Yeah, because I was saying, and God said, if you're unkind to your neighbors, you know. <laughs> so anyway, I still want to get to the, well, how, did, how did you get caught? Well, what happened was that, well, actually you got part of the story yeah. in what I sent you. What happened was that the, uh, uh, the Stoop fan, I mean, uh, Elie Wiesel, you know, put, put himself there as the, the big hero, got the Nobel Prize for helping the Cambodians. The two guys that should get the Nobel, they should have gotten both the Nobel Prize and statues of these two Slovakian boys. Nobody ever escaped from Auschwitz. All electric fences and everything. Because the Nazis knew they didn't want the world to know what was going on, okay? And that was showed you that the rebellion of Jews existed. Or underground, they arranged and worked out for these two boys. They wanted them to get out to warn the Hungarian Jews that they are preparing the, everything for them to be killed. That's why they got out, not for themselves, okay? And you know, when I found out that Wetzler was alive in Bratislava, I went to visit him. I became very close friends with him. I was amazing. And so anyway, so what happened was exactly what you read. We were told, because the Russians were winning, Stalingrad was occupied, and they were moving close to the Hungarian border. So what happened was that uh, uh, they were going to uh, uh, deport the Jews because they couldn't be sure of our loyalty, you know, with the Russians coming. And they, but the Hungarians were going to take us to another part of Hungary, you know. The Hungarians weren't going along with the concentration Oh, yeah, they were camp. part of the... Oh, they were. Oh, yeah, part okay. of the Nazi alliance. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so... Uh, but they were, not, they were not doing the things because they were independent. They didn't persecute they didn't, the Jews. They, yeah. They didn't do any of the, My grandfather had his business. In other words, they aligned themselves, they aligned themselves with the militarily. Nazis. Militarily. but so far as, uh, hey, we're going to put... You know, we're going to turn over they the didn't Jews have and any things Jewish like that. They, laws, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then what happened was that uh, um, when these two boys escaped Auschwitz, they went and they spoke to the, they got the peasants again, non-Jews, hid them. And the Germans offered something like a million marks for the two Jews if they were given up. And the peasants didn't do it. Instead, they got in touch with the nuncio, mm -hmm. the Catholic nuncio, and he came up and they told him the story, and they couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it, and he went and told the story to, pope, to the Pope. And the Pope, who was, you know, not the greatest in terms of that, this time he did do a remarkable thing. He got in touch with Roosevelt, 
and Churchill and told them what was happening. And Roosevelt then sent a message to the head of the government, if you deport, he was not a fascist, he was, you know, the regular government. If you deport the Jews, you will be held as a criminal, as a war criminal. Well, well, the Germans found out about this whole operation. When well, they found out about it, Hitler invited the head of the government to come and visit him. And when the guy was on his way to visit him, they occupied Hungary. Mm, okay. Okay. And immediately passed the Nazi laws. Yeah, the Jewish laws. Jewish, oh, yeah. And uh, so then the idea was that uh, uh, we were going to be, but not nothing dangerous, we were just going to be moved to Hungarian. Fascists went along with them, you know. They did all the, this is why we trusted them, because they were Hungarians, so we felt it wasn't like the Nazis. And so uh, that's what happened on the first Passover night, okay? Like my grandfather was in the middle of conducting the Seder, but there was a knock on the door. And one of the non-Jewish friends heard, knew something was going on. They came to warn him, as they did some other people. Again, individuals, that's what I mean, mm -hmm. see. And uh, there was a frantic rush. Now, my mother had gotten my uncles to prepare the cellar where we could hide, at least for a couple of weeks, until the Russians came. You know, it was in my uncle's grocery store, and it was hidden under the ground. And they rushed immediately that night to finish it, to do whatever they could. And the idea was that they were going to go the next morning. We were going to hide in the cellar until uh, the Russians came. And, um, and then what happened was that <laughs> didn't get, to get to the cellar, you had to go to my uncle's grocery store, which was on the main street. Nobody expected that there would be guys with machine guns on the main street. And my uncle was went out, look, came and said, we can't go, they're gonna kill us. They're right there on the street watching for any Jews doing anything. So we went to the normal cellar. We hid in the normal cellar, and uh, which was, by the way, you were having a Seder. The Seder was completely... What? You were having a Seder, and when these people came to the door... We stopped the Seder. You stopped the we Seder. Stopped the packing. Seder never got we finished. We started packing. We started packing for the next day. And um, so uh, what happened was that the Jews were told all to meet in the square, in the synagogue, in the yard of the synagogue, and from there we were going to go to the ghetto. And uh, we were in the cellar, mm -hmm. but we were insecure because the porter who worked for the hotel, I'm sure there was a feeling that he wanted to take the hotel. So we saw a shadow go by all the time by the door the, the, to the leading to the, to the cellar. So we decided to try to take a risk to send one of the kids to go to the synagogue yard to see what's going on. And uh, I volunteered, but because of my background, and, and my cousin was the same age, but the youngest one, his name was Getzel. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful little boy. I go, nobody's gonna catch me. He's eight years old. Nobody's gonna do anything. Don't worry, man. I'm, I'll, I'll do it. So they told him, now listen, don't worry. If you don't come back within two hours, we all leave and we go to the yard, because then we'll know you're in trouble, okay? So we're not gonna abandon. So he leaves, and we told that when he comes back to be careful that nobody notices him, he's to throw some mm -hmm. little stones to them. Yeah. And so we're waiting, and he comes back, little stones, and his brother goes and opens the 
door, what's, what's happening? Well, the tailor next to us was in hiding. They shot him and his family. That unless you come out into the yard, they're gonna go through every building and whoever they find hiding, everybody gets killed, okay? My mother was still wanted to take a risk, but her sister-in-law with Rella, my cousin that I was in love with, mm -hmm. um, she was terrified. She said, no, no, I'm taking the kids, I'm going out. So we decided, okay, we all go out because we knew if she was grasped at something, they'd torture her and they'd find out where we were. So my mother said, okay. So we all go to the ghetto and we went, we were lucky because my uncle had a house there. Mm -hmm. So all of us could sleep in the attic. Right. So we went up to the attic and with mattresses and stuff and stayed there. And then the Hungarian leadership assured us that we not to worry. We're going to Hungary, the Hungarians are taking care of it. We're going to a place where, just to escape the Russians, no Nazis were involved. But of course, then we heard the story that Eichmann, you know, mm -hmm. who was a killer of all the, you know, the charge, you know, was in Budapest. He was the architect of the... Yeah, 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 and he, when the two boys escaped and word got to the Jews in Budapest, what was happening, they confronted him. They confronted Eichmann and said, what is this we hear? So then he guaranteed, as I wrote to you, your families will not be touched if you shut up, if you don't say anything. So they did, they never said anything. He kept assuring us mm -hmm. that, and the guy was the head, Kastner yeah. was the head of it. After, after Israel was established, yeah. he moved to Israel and of course, they took him to court, and the court there acquitted him. They felt, well, yeah. the war. But let, let's, oh, wait, let me finish. Yeah, okay. What happened is, one day he's walking down the street, a yeah. guy comes up and kills him. <laughs> anyway, how did you get caught? That's, right. How did you get caught? That's, you know, how did you and your family get captured and sent away to a camp? Well, we, because... We were in the cellar, we went to the ghetto. Mm -hmm. The ghetto was completely closed off. And, um, and from the ghetto, we were taken to a brick factory because trains could go in there. And that's where the cattle cars came. I see. So yeah. once, you, once you moved into the ghetto area, yeah. you kind we of, didn't it was know. like, it was like thought, you walked into a prison. We thought we were, yeah, we thought yeah. we were being taken to Hungary. Even my grandfather was, brilliant man all that believed yeah. that we would, because it was 1944 the Nazis were losing Stalingrad was gone uh, they, they didn't need any more trouble or problems right you know my mother was the only one what are your remembrances of the cattle car what what are your remembrances of the cattle car the cattle car well first of all um, I wanted as a kid I wanted to run away, mm -hmm. and I wanted my mother to find a way so we would run away. Yeah. And uh, and she said, if they get us, they'll kill us all. This way, I'll never forget this. Talking, talking to a twelve-year-old. This way, one of us might survive. Never know. But the other way, they kill us all. So we just go along in case somebody gets saved. So, get in a cattle car, 80 people in a cattle car. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, and my mother was the only one with a sense of humor, because when the uh, uh, Jewish policemen came to the cattle car, they announced that there were two big, uh, you know, you know, one of the things, in the army that they carry the food, the big uh, kettles. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He said, there's one here for the men, one there for the women. 
So if you need to go, you go. And was, and my mother said, and how about some toilet paper? And everybody laughed, and, you know, but she always tried to <laughs> find a way to, you know. And, um, and then, so what happened was uh, that uh, my grandfather, who, were, who was knowledgeable about the territory, so uh, what happened was he always kept looking out. There were wires on the window, on the window, the opening of the castle. Yeah. And so he kept looking out all the time. And, and at one point, he turned into the car, I'll never forget this, and he broke down crying. And what happened to my mother? We just crossed into Poland, meaning, no, excuse me, sorry, we, no. First he said we crossed into Bohemia. And in Bohemia, the Hungarian soldiers left and the SS took over, mm -hmm. right? And then he saw through the window that we went into Poland. And he knew about stories that happened in Poland, mm -hmm. people to kill them there, you know? And he broke down and he felt it was his fault. That he should have known, he should have seen, you know? Anyway, uh, uh, so then we, my mother took over standing at the window to watch where we were going. Now what happened was, at, I was then 13, mm -hmm. my cousin Rella was 12, and a romance started between us, and so I said, you know, we had a marriage ceremony. We were hiding in a cellar, and her father had a bar, so she brought some wine, and we had a ceremony that we were married. And then she went, I said, well, now I had to Legally break. married? What? Legally married? Well, the two of us, I was 13, she was 12. Uh, was this like a pretend uh, way? We said, this, we imitated. Well, oh, okay, all right. <laughs> and so... It was your first brush with in theater. The, in the <laughs> wedding, in a, in, a, in a wedding, you break the glass so nobody... Right. So I went and broke the glass. She picked up all the shreds. She said, no, no, I'm going to save this. I don't want this to disappear. And then she said to me, but how will, how will you know that I'm your wife? I, I can't have a ring because people suspect. She said, oh, I know. Whenever you look at me and I go like this, you'll know mm -hmm. that um, I, it's like a ring, mm -hmm. okay? So family started to suspect something was going on. And my mother took me and warned me never again to see my cousin alone with her, you know? And uh, even though there was a Jewish school, mm -hmm. I was not to go anywhere near her. And because what happened was, uh, she went home, at, at one point went home, and she was bleeding. So her mother called the doctor, it's not her, her first period that she had, right? The doctor said it wasn't the first period. Someone tried to penetrate, and then they kept us always apart. In the ghetto, the first thing they did, she was on one end, I was on the other, mm -hmm. right? And we, in the middle of the night, we would get up and right. wave to each other, you know. Now, let's get back to the cattle car. To the one? To the cattle car. Where did it wind up? This is, so wait. So, oh no, what happened was when we went to the brick factory. Okay. Okay, so we were, the whole family, our family, plus others, there were 80 of us mm -hmm. in the cattle car. And oh, even there, the first thing was to keep me and my cousin apart. That's what my oh, daughter. Okay. My daughter is called Rella. Yeah. After her, you know, mm -hmm. and so uh, it's to keep us apart. Now we suddenly arrive at a place in the middle of the night, and uh, my mother looks out. Oh no! Before the middle of the night, early evening. Yeah. She sees 
men and women with uniforms, you know, with uh, striped prison uniforms, with shovels, going to work, because the others still believed that we're going to a labor camp. It's going to be a labor camp. Yeah. My mother looked out and she saw this, and I intuitively went to Rella's mother and asked her, could I sleep next to Rella? And the mother looked at my mother and said to her, he asks whether he can sleep. I'll never forget. My mother turned her head and went like that, mm -hmm. right? So I slept next to her, made love to her for the first time. And I even said to her, now you're a real woman, you know. And probably she may have even gotten pregnant, who knows. Anyway, the next morning, we hear them. Was that, the, that, was that your first time? What? Was that yeah. your first time? Yeah. Wow. The next morning, you hear them coming close to the cattle car. And uh, my mother, unlike in Nazi fucking Holocaust movies, Auschwitz, ah, eh, brushed my sister's hair, straightened out my sweater, made sure that we looked good, that, you know, we're coming to a place. And then, you know, she was so amazing. She says, now listen, you have an uncle in America. His name is Joe, Joe Garfine. So just remember, because we never know what might happen. Now she says this to a 12-year-old, right, and a nine-year-old kid, right? The others were all telling their kids, don't worry, everything is fine. You'll be going to work, and she was always telling us what was really happening and what could be happening. And so the doors open, big lights on, and they're yelling, okay, get out, leave the bags on the side of the train. They will all be delivered to you. The next morning, they're all marked. You will all have your bags, okay? So we left, we get off, and they're hitting people who are not. And then there's the couples. Those are the Jews who yeah. are working kind of as guards. Yeah. Yeah. The only ones that would never do it were the Greek Jews. Even though they were threatened with going into the gas chamber, they said, it's fine, we go. They wouldn't, the couples, they wouldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. Anyway. What, now, where are you now? What camp is, what camp is this? Auschwitz. This is Auschwitz. Yeah. Why don't we stop right there? What? Why don't we stop right there and we'll pick okay, it up? Okay. okay. So we return to Jack Garfine and uh, uh, a phenomenal story. I got to tell you something, Jack. Before we go further, you know, when I was younger, uh, then my, what? M when I was younger, yeah. uh, my my father-in-law and my uh, mother-in-law were both uh, Jews uh, escaping. Uh, and uh, telling stories, phenomenal stories of heroism and everything around the around a Passover table, and they were Bundists, and um, but you know we'd hear about people who did this and fought in the underground and in Paris and so on, and my wife said to me, why don't you record these people? Because I had a videotape yeah. recorder, and I never got around to it, and then they all passed. And to this day, I have felt kind of guilty that I didn't <laughs> interview somebody on this. Yeah, yeah. And now I've got you to help me assuage my guilt. <laughs> oh, as well, were. great, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, now, this is a heck of a place to pick up the story. But you were getting off the cattle car, and there's Auschwitz. Yeah. You're there. Uh, Auschwitz is probably the most iconic, I guess, of the concentration camps. You were in 11 of them total yeah. through no, this no, whole story. The, the worst is the last one I was in, Bergen-Belsen. Bergen-Belsen. Yeah. yeah. And also people who had been in Auschwitz for a long time felt that Bergen-Belsen was the worst. I wasn't there, you know. I mean, I was in Auschwitz for about a couple of weeks or three weeks. Yeah. But uh, the ones that were there for a long time in, in Belsen, Felt bells and yeah, that was the worst. Now uh, Auschwitz, you get off the you get off the cattle. I car. didn't know it was Auschwitz. I just you, knew yeah. we were getting off. And you got off, 
And what is your first memory of, of getting out of that cattle car? I mean, uh, the shouts of the uh, couples saying, uh, and also seeing the assessment with dogs, with uh, what do you call it, the wolf dogs. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, German shepherds. Shepherds, German shepherds yeah. standing in the back. And the couples yelling, just yelling. Everybody uh, uh, over 46 and under 16 over to the side. Only people between 16 and 46 stay there, right? Everybody else to the side. And you're how old at this time? I'm 12. 12. 12. Yeah. Okay. And I'm, oh no, 13, excuse 13. me. I was bar mitzvah, yeah, 13. And, uh, and what happened was the couples are yelling like that. And uh, some, everybody was trying to do whatever they were yelling. But my yeah. mother, again, grabbed one of the Jewish couples and said, you're a Jew. Tell me what's going on here. And he ran away because if the Nazis noticed that he was talking or was telling them what's happening, they'd kill him. You know, they'd take mm -hmm. him back of the train and shoot him. So then she grabbed another guy and said, you're a Jew, tell me what's going on here. The guy said, leave the children, leave the old people. And he ran away. I'll never forget my mother's look. I'll never forget. What? She was trying to grasp something like that. And then she went and grabbed another guy. You're a Jew, tell me what's happening, what's going on? Leave the children, leave the old people. And he ran away. And, and unlike other people who didn't do that or didn't believe or anything, my mother <laughs> takes me and says, and he says to me, get over there with the men. You know, the bunch mm -hmm between 46 and 60. And I again felt, oh, she was protecting my sister because I always felt she was a favorite. And I thought, what, what harm is there for kids? They're not gonna do anything to a kid, okay? Right. So I said, I, I said no, Mama, I'm not going. I wanna stay with you. I'm staying with you. And she then went and pushed me away and said, I hate you, I never wanted to have you. You were born, but I didn't want to have you as a child. I always disliked you and I don't want to see you anymore. Get away from me and don't ever come back here and pushed me to the men's side. And I looked back at her and I remember my exact thought, I hope she drops dead or if not, I'll die, and that'll make her really yeah. feel badly. And then, amazing thing, uh, we stand in line with the men, I stand in line with the men. And again, unlike Hollywood movies, you know, blah, 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 blah. Mangala, the doctor. Mangala? Yeah, very, he looked at me. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. you're in a line, yeah. I guess Mengele is checking out each of the men. Yeah, yeah. And I come up to him, and he looks at me kindly. And he looks, and he says, uh, he touches my face like this. Yeah. He touches me, right? Yeah. Like yeah. this. How old are you? Out of the blue. I don't know where it came from. I said, 16. Right? He looked at me like, is that so? When a man behind me with a stubble of a beard said, Your Excellency, he and I, this kid and I are famous mosaic artists all over Europe. I didn't know what a mosaic artist even was. And Mengele went, just looked at my eye like that, patted me and Sent me to how, how did you know this was Mengele? Did he identify himself? I didn't himself? know. I just knew he was a doctor. I found out later that that was Mengele. I just knew it was a guy who decided, just looked at you to decide something. I didn't know 
what was going on about gas chambers. Uh, so anyway, did you find this out in later years, or did you find this out? At, uh, oh no, at I the found time? it. I found it out at the end of the war, mm -hmm. already during the war. And then you've seen pictures of Mengele since, and that was the man. What? You, you've seen pictures of Mengele since. Yeah, yeah. And that's the man that you saw. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so what happened was, he went to pointed me and the guy to the left. And I turned to the guy, and I said, what did, what did you say? What, did you, what is this? Because I never knew what a mosaic artist was. You know? And he knew the problem, so he ran right into the camp. Do you know what I did? I turned around. I went back to tell that nice Nazi officer <laughs> <laughs> that I lied. I wasn't 16. I was only 13 years old. When a Jewish couple walked over, I said, where are you going? Where are you going? Oh, I'm sorry. I lied to that German officer and tell them, told him I was 16. I'm not 16, I'm 13. He took a stick, hit me over the head, get the hell in there, pushed me into the camp, right? Okay, a couple of things here. Number one, your mother saved your life. About what? Your mother saved yeah. your life. By making, well, but by kids, doing it in the, in the most horrible way, coming she up on April fifteenth. Yeah. So my kids on April fifteenth always send me a happy birthday. Really. Yeah. But she, she literally alienated you to get you to go somewhere else and yeah, save yeah. your life, yeah. knowing that she could do nothing about herself, knowing that she could do nothing about your sister. Yeah. 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 But what happened was, yeah. my cousin who was eighteen, a woman, her, she was. My, my mother's sister's daughter. So she went, oh, she told me the story when I met her after the war. She said, I went over to your mother. I said, listen, my mother will take care of Hadi, which is my sister. And, and you go with me because I'm alone. And my mother, she said, was about to do that when your sister pulled her hand and said, don't leave me, mommy. And she looked at me, she, my cousin said, I can't go. I'm not going. I'm staying. Yeah. So, so, and then the second person to save your life was this capo who said, don't go back to that guy and tell him that. Yeah, yeah. Right. But now the Orthodox Jews have a story in the, in the Oxford story of the Holocaust. They heard the story. They never talked to me. But the reporter got in touch with me. He said, did you hear the story? I said, no. This is the story. The story according to Orthodox Jews is that um, uh, this little boy, Jacob, was online in Auschwitz. And Elijah answers the prayers of a mother. Mm -hmm. And he arrived with a stubble of a beard. And he has a stubble of a beard. And he answers the prayers, and so he saved this little boy, okay? Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, fine. Leave it to the Orthodox to find a miracle. To find a miracle. I got to do with that. Now, it's true. I never saw that guy again. Yeah. I tried to see him. I tried to find him. I never found him again. And now, okay, so wait, how many years later? Uh, let's see, 30 years later. My second marriage, you know, 40 years. I, um, what happened is we have a Passover Seder, mm -hmm. yeah. okay? And um, I lived in Madrid, no, I lived in Paris, and my ex-wife lived in, in Madrid. And I had to bring all the stuff from Paris. They still didn't have those things, you know, so I mm -hmm. brought matzahs, wine, everything. We set up a Seder. And my ex-wife says, oh my God, Jack, I have no candlesticks. And then she went and looked and she found two plastic candlesticks. And she lit them, okay? And we had the Passover Seder. My daughter was, uh, I think maybe, what, a year old or something. Mm -hmm. but she was already asleep in bed at four o'clock in the morning. Anna wakes me up, Jack, look at the ceiling. 
I look at the ceiling is black. We run into my daughter's room, black under the, under the nose, you know, but she's breathing. And we run into the room. What happened? The candle, the plastic candlestick oh, wow. melted and the tablecloth caught fire. And guess what? Stopped at the cup of Elijah. <laughs> uh, modern so, day miracle. <laughs> so we said, if you have, if we ever have a boy, yeah. his name is going to be Elijah. And so my second boy, his name is Elias. He's named after. Let's get back to Auschwitz. You were there for two weeks. What? You were at Auschwitz for two weeks. You said. Yeah. And well, the first day was second day. Was amazing. I thought my father was dead. Yeah, you know, and I'm and I'm little, so I'm in the front row, and the guy who counts the people and reports back mm -hmm. how many there are comes down the line counting, and as he moves down the line, I recognize it's my father. Wow. He stops in front of me. You know what he said? What did he say? What are you doing here? Because he was a Zionist leader. He worked for the underground. Yeah. He sent the Polish Jews to Palestine, took all sorts of risks. And the reward was that if you were in the underground yeah. and you did that, mm -hmm. your kids would be sent to Palestine wow. to be safe. What happened was that was arranged when the Hungarian Jews found out about it Two kids, rich Jews, that money, two kids went out under my name and my sister's name to Palestine, okay? So uh, when I said to him, and he said, is your mother and your sister? I said, yes, they, they went to the old age home because that's what we were told. Mm -hmm. That it was an old age home and they go to an old age home. And I noticed tears appearing in my father's eyes when the assessment yelled, what is going on there? Because he saw him stopping, you know? And so he went on counting. And then the barracks at night, he took a big risk because you were not allowed to go into. Otherwise, he came to see me. And, and, I, and he said, he wanted to know about the rest of them. I said, yeah, they all went to the old age home. So he said, that he was going to find a way to join me in the transport to go with me. Now, if you did that illegally, and if they found out it was father and son, you were killed. OK? I knew that I knew. And I said, no, no, you're not going. But I didn't think of that. I said, no, no, you got to stay here, because mother and, and my sister are here. you got to stay here with them. and. Watch them. I'll be fine. I'll, I'll take care of myself, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he came back once more, the night before we were leaving, but before I was, I was take, gonna be taken to a labor camp, you know. Yeah. He came that night, and uh, he said to me, "Now one thing, young Kush, never cry, no matter what they do to you." Don't ever cry. So it went to my head, and I never, no matter what, they beat me, they hit me, so I was fine. Because if you cried and thing, they felt, oh, there's nothing, you know. They hit you more. And, uh, and so I was put into a cattle car. And that was the last you saw your father or your mother yeah. or your sister. And then my best friend, Oscar, es escaped. I mean, what happened was uh, he arrived in Auschwitz. And after the end of the war, he found out that I was alive. So he came to see me because he ran into my father. And my father said to him, if you ever see Yankush, tell him I haven't had a day of rest since he left. Yankish was your name. And that was it. That was it. That was it. 
And so where were you off to then? Well, they sent me to a labor camp. And so I had to go out early, six o'clock in the morning, to work on railroads, building railroads. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I was transferred from there to another camp, all in the same vicinity, called Merzbachtal. And there they again went out to labor camps. And uh, the commandant decided of the camp to have a doorman be somebody, a kid. Mm -hmm. So he picked me and uh, I was to open the door and of the camp and greet. And I had a booth, mm -hmm. you know, a little booth where I stayed in case it rained. Yeah. And there was a Wehrmacht, not the SS, some of the, this guy, and some of the soldiers. And this Wehrmacht guy insisted that I learn math because he says, the war is going to be over. You're, going to, you're not going to be able to go to school. And he didn't believe anything that I told him that I said about people being killed. He said, the German people would never do that. Don't be silly. Don't listen to that. And he insisted that I work on math. And he would check me. Every time I came to the gate, he was in charge. Mm -hmm. Seven times seven. Six times six, you know. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and again, you have an individual taking uh, the yeah. initiative. You told me a story once uh, about the fact that you were on some kind of a death march. Did what? Kind of on a de you were on a death march. Yeah, yeah. Where was that exactly? Do you remember? That was from that camp. From that camp, and that um, you were at the brink of falling down. Can you tell that story about what happened? Because no, because everybody thinks of Nazis as all being terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and this is no, a wonderful the, story. You know, I told my son when he was eleven or twelve years old, mm -hmm. and when he went to school, and they found out that his father was in a camp, and they asked him, "What did he tell you?" He told this story because I wanted him to know human beings. I did. Okay, but tell the story to the So the story was that the death march, it was winter. I you know, had some clothes and wooden shoes, but you know, and so there was a motorbike outfit who kept constantly running back and forth. And they saw anybody wiggling or shaking or not being able to make it, they killed him. You had to be, you had to be able to go to march. And, um, this soldier came with his gun, put it under my arm, and carried me. And when he saw the motorbike guys coming, he said to me, now listen, I have to leave now, but you stand straight and walk like you're very strong, and I'll come back. But don't wiggle, don't move, don't, you know. And so the motorbike guys went by, I was fine. He came back, put his gun under my arm, and carried me again, which is why... So, so I, this almost goes again, you think of every Nazi as being yeah, heartless. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, but that's why, for example, and I, I, uh, I did the Kafka thing, mm -hmm. because that's what the guy said, I hate humanity, but not individual. As humans. individuals, humans can do extraordinary yeah, things. Of course, of course. And uh, even now, what as ridiculous as this terrible, terrible thing, you know, saying never again, another lie. What the fuck do you mean, never again? What's happening to the Rohingya? What's happening to people in Syria? What are you talking about? And so are you gonna believe never again? No. What you have to believe is keep your eyes open and see that humanity is horrible and that only individuals are great so that you know that they're capable of doing terrible things and not never again, because that won't ever happen. You told me another story. Yeah. Um, and, and this one was, I don't know, you were getting off at some camp. I don't know which one it was, you probably know. And 
they were starting to shoot at people as you got off the off the cattle yeah, car. It was the last camp. And, you know, and and that was Bergen Belsen, I yeah. guess. And and in this particular case, again, you managed to avoid I dying didn't know I in was the avoiding. camps. I was just doing so what I. Well, tell, uh, recount that story a little bit. For well, us. we were packed into a, a, a cattle car, mm -hmm. and we were given a ration, some bread, and all that. And the guy behind me, a Jew, was trying to get my ration and was trying to kill me. He was trying to choke me. And so I went, bit his thigh, and screamed. And then he knew to leave me alone, okay? Mm -hmm. And then we arrive in Bells, and the door is open. They tell us to get out, and machine guns are going. And I got flat on the ground, because I felt, if you shoot, you have to be flat, and I crawled to a truck, okay, which was parked, I felt. I get on this truck. I climbed up on the truck. Imagine, I was then 14, mm -hmm. and you know, not in the, <laughs> pretty hungry, and yeah. yeah, yeah, and climbed up on the truck because people were lying down there only to realize they were all dead. And then the truck starts off. You're in a truck full of dead top, people. On top of the truck. And they're all dead. They loaded them up. They shot them, and then they loaded them up there. And I'm, I thought they were just lying down like I was. Yeah. And I'm on top of them. You're and on top of the bodies? Oh, my God. And now the truck arrives at a huge fire pit where obviously they're going to throw the bodies into the fire pit. I guess what I did. What? <laughs> I guess. I jump off the truck. I open the door to the driver's side and I say, let's go, we gotta unload these bodies. Wow, you you really, you're a survivor, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean. Well, you know, Clorman, Harold Clorman asked me, yeah. Jack, I just wanna know one. How do you survive a concentration camp? I said, I cannot tell you how you survive, but I can tell you how you don't survive. He said, how is that? If you feel sorry for yourself, wow. then you don't make it. Let me, this is a question that's been, when I was knowing that I was gonna interview you, uh, which I, I always kind of, sometimes I don't like to interview people I know really well because it's very difficult in a lot of ways. But there were quest there was one question and it was a burning question that, uh, that I have because of my, my involvement with comedy and so on. Was there anything in, the, in your life in the camps where people laughed about something? Oh, sure. I mean, there was humor, wasn't well, not there? Not just humor, but dancing and singing. For example, I learned a, a, a song, a Hasidic song, from the Hungarian Jews, which to this day, um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I sing it, and uh, it goes like this. Oi, irrebel, ich stay in zitter, in mein Herzl brennt a fire. Yach, well, sein a chusel la gitter, a chusel a gitter. Oh, Rabbi. In my heart burns a fire. I just want to tell you, I'm going to be loyal and true to you in the religion, you know. And so, so in other words, in, in the concentration camps, which we think of as the most dour of circumstances. Yeah. All right. There was dancing. There was singing. There was laughing. Yeah. Because uh, 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 you, it, it just nobody ever asked that question, and it's never portrayed. Yeah. You know? Well, there's also the guy that heard that I, uh, he's, he's an Italian composer. Yeah. And uh, he's done, de devoted to try to find out the songs from the camps. Mm -hmm. And he converted to Judaism after mm -hmm. he heard a lot of the songs. Someone said to him, there's this guy, he was a kid and he remembers a song that one of the kids wrote in the camps. The guy came to Paris. When he heard the song, next time he brought a crew. 
and they filmed me singing the song. And it's now on a DVD in Italy, but now everywhere else they're selling it. So the song there, now this was a fascinating story. Yeah. So the Germans, what happened was the civilians, we walked through the towns to go to work. So the German people were very upset. They saw kids going to work with shovels and picks. And their own kids wanted to have answers. So they complained about that to the command. And so they decided they had to find a way to get mm -hmm. rid of the kids. Mm -hmm. So guess what? What? They announced, because we knew what was going on at that point. Mm -hmm. There was no kidding around about, you know. So they said that the British decided to exchange German prisoners for Jewish kids in the camps. And we had to, if you wanted to, you volunteer for it. Most of the kids volunteered from all the camps around. Mm -hmm. And it was all in my camp in Merzbachtal, right? Mm -hmm. And I too felt I joined them, you know. And now they gave us wonderful food, dressed us in nice, good clothes, because, you know, the British should see it. So we believed absolutely that it's going to happen. Yeah. But then the day that we were lined up in mm -hmm. the square, what happened was soldiers showed up with guns, surrounded us. We thought, well, maybe they have to march us through the town and they want to, you know, but then an ambulance showed up with three sick people. Now we knew, whoa, we were 612 kids. And we knew ambulance, sick people are going to be exchanged for them. And so the Germans, if, you, if 612 had to go, it couldn't be 613 or 611. So they decided to exchange three kids for the three sick people. And I was with my cousin in the group, but they, I was also, that's the camp where I was the doorman, mm -hmm. you know. So now the kids knew they were selecting three to take out. They all raised their hands yelling, me, me. I thought, well, all right, go back to Auschwitz, I'll see my dad again. I mean, that was my thought. But then at the, they picked out two. At the last minute, I raised my hand and they noticed me, and they, and they said, okay, picked me out. My cousin, the rest, one of the last transports taken to Auschwitz. Yeah, wow. Ah, these, are some, these are some amazing stories, Jack. Yeah. You know, you, you, you survived a lot. Um, yeah, but it's getting know. tough now. Well, how does it, how's it getting tough? What? How's it getting tough? It's a... I managed somehow, up to now, to, to suppress the reality like, like even on Passover, I was thinking about the Egyptians and the Jews were liberated and happy Passover, as you can see. This year it was impossible. You didn't have a Passover yes. that year. My son had a Passover Seder the whole family, the kids there. I said to Natalia, I don't think I want to go this. She said, no, come on, you got to, you got to go. I went. I Let me ask you this, though. I broke down. Y years have passed. You've gone on, as maybe in another interview, if we get to do another one with you, if you'll grace us with another interview yeah, at some time. If you grace us with another interview at some time, we can get into your history as a director, as a writer, as, a, as an artist, uh, uh, and, and all the famous people that you mentored and, and so on. Uh, and that's an important, very important part of your life. But this part of your life happened before that, and then you had this other period, and now as you get older, it's bothering you more yeah. than it bothered you, say, when you were in your 30s or when you were in your 40s uh, or I, 50s. Why is I, that? Well, two things. Once, 
first the conditioning when you're a kid. Yeah. You don't try to understand what's happening and why it's happening. Mm -hmm. You accept this is what it's supposed to be, it's life. Yeah. And also you have no ability to understand it. You only know this is what I'm supposed to do. You can't grasp. You haven't got the words or the ways to explain. That's why you, when you're a kid, you cry mama or papa or whatever, but you don't grasp the things. And so, in a sense, that's what made me pull through in a way that I completely, for example, I had trouble with my marriages too, because uh, I, there was no way I could believe in love. You, you had trouble you told me, with your mother, from the fact that she said, I never loved you, I never wanted you, yeah. and you went through your entire life believing she did Not my didn't. entire life, up to a certain point. Well, up to a certain point, but that was more recently. No, no. When did, you, was, when did you suddenly realize that she, in fact, after, had saved your life and didn't hate you? After my divorce from my first wife, I, uh, I went to an analyst, okay? First time I went to an analyst, and... I need one now, <laughs> and uh, and when I and what happened was that uh, uh, after uh, I was there for I went for five days a week for two years, and uh, at the end I was leaving back going back to New York, mm -hmm. and he said to me. So, Mr. Garfine, what have you gotten out of this analysis? I said, well, what I've gotten, the war is over. You, don't, you know, people are all kind. You can have a life. I have two kids. He said, yeah, but Mr. Garfine, what about love and woman? I mean, after all, you came here because your marriage broke up. So what, what, do you, what have you learned? I said, well, uh, let me think about it. <laughs> so two weeks later, I said, well, I know you want me to articulate it, but I can't. You have to help me. So he said, well, one thing, Mr. Garfield. You were 13 years old. Your sister was 10. You couldn't save her. You were not responsible. You couldn't save her. Stop being attracted to women you want to save. Flabbergasted. <laughs> because my first wife was married to a gangster, you know, and she was a chorus. Your first wife was the actress Carol Baker. Yeah, yeah. And she was mentioned. married first in a chorus line, and you know. Mm -hmm. And then she married this guy who was a gangster. She was 19, he was in his 60s. You know, so. And so you felt you were saving her. And I did save but her. But coming to terms with your mother. So wait. So then he said, he said, and uh, what happened, Jack? He said, what about um, your mother? He said, Be what happened was that I said, uh, let me see, to be very clear about this. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So about three years ago, four years ago, mm -hmm. the Film Forum gave me a tribute here mm -hmm. for my film work. Mm -hmm. And in the audience was a friend of mine, Jack, who became a famous analyst in New York. And... Uh, and I only met him before that, a few years before. But he went through the camps, right? Mm -hmm. And he came to the theater. And I told the story I just told you. Yeah. And uh, that people asked me, what, Auschwitz, what happened? And I told about my, yeah, right. about the analyst. And says, During the break in the film, between two films, Jack came over to me and said, well, that analyst was on the right track, Jack. But he didn't get it right. I said, what are you talking about? It wasn't your sister, Jack. 
was your mother. It's okay, Jack, if you don't want to talk about it. It's because you couldn't save her. And that must have been the reason, because look at what you're doing now. You know, look at how you're reacting to it. Let's get. And look, I even when I talk about it like that, I realize that's books. Wow. And Let's that's when I realized fully, although I had good friends like Sean O'Casey, the playwright, great playwright. I was doing Shadow of Gunman on Broadway, without ever talking to him about my life or anything. He sensed in me that it had something to do with my mother, but it was never this definite like what Jack did. But now you say that you are more kind of depressed than you have been. Uh, you're more depressed than you have been about those days in the camps. And, and that, it's days kind in of camps. interesting that, that there was this period of your life where, hey, you had life and you did it, and now it's at the very towards the end of your life yeah, yeah. God willing you live to be a thousand but you know yeah. as you've gotten older you're 87 now all of a sudden uh, you're you're like these things really bother you yeah. you know let me let me it's not bother let, it's yeah you see the reality yeah let me let me you refuse to see before. let's let's finish this thing off by a remembrance of the day you got liberated what? The day you were liberated. Yeah. The day the camps got liberated. Yeah. Do you do you remember that? It's coming that? up now. It's coming up. April fifteenth. April fifteenth is Liberation Day, yeah. or the day, or somebody said your birthday. My kids. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, liberation Day. Uh, it's also Tax Day too. But <laughs> um, what what do you remember about that day of liberation? What? what do you remember about that day of liberation? Did you believe it when it was happening, or did you? Uh, the, it was like three days before that we knew the British were coming close. And yeah. I knew I only had three days to live. I somehow knew I had enough energy to last three days. And after that, I, couldn't, I wouldn't have enough energy. You were that weak. What? You were that weak. Yeah, yeah I weighed yeah. 48 pounds, oh, wow. 23 kilos, you know. I couldn't move anymore. And uh, I couldn't walk, I couldn't move and defecated in place, you know. And, uh, and then the British came on the second day and came over to me in it because they were now going to disinfect people. They set up a place to disinfect you and give you a new set of clothes and that. And they took me to the disinfecting room and they asked me to take my clothes off. And I said, no, no. I'm not giving up my clothes. No. And my hair was up like this with gook yeah. stuff. Yeah. And so they called the British officer who spoke Yiddish. And he came to me and he said, listen, I guarantee you, you go to the disinfecting room, I will bring your clothes back. And I will have them done and you will have your clothes. And then I noticed he turned away and cried. That's what made me believe him. Mm -hmm. And look at the difference between America and the British. Because when I came here, you know, my family put me in a foster home, you know. They didn't want to keep me, I was saying. And, uh, and once I start, got a scholarship from Piscato in a dramatic workshop where Rod Steiger, Walter Matthau, uh, they were my classmates, you mm -hmm. know. And, uh, and so, um, I forgot. Well, let, let, we, we, so it's Liberation Day and you're finally liberated and they sent you to a hospital in Sweden, did you say? No, that was later. But let me yeah. finish the story. Okay. It's important. 
So uh, when I got into that school, they arranged for the foster home to move me to Central Park West. Before that, I was in Queens at the, the doctor's place. And they were very nice. She was very nice. The woman to me took care of me. But at 18, I had to leave. I was on my own. Mm -hmm. So I was packing. I didn't see my clothes from Belgium. I said to the woman, what happened? I had my clothes in Belgium. Oh, Jack, I didn't want you to have that, to see that, so I threw it in the garbage. Uh, here was a difference, which this day exists in America. Yeah. Forget the past, don't deal with it. Right. And so it was, I hated that woman after that, <laughs> but then I realized she was simply the consequence of a Hollywood philosophy. Happy ending. Don't think about it. Okay. And uh, so that's, a, you could see the contrast. What did you want to know? No, you, you went to a hospital then in yeah. Sweden or something where. Oh, yeah. You they had... put me in a room by myself. Yeah. And I thought. Uh, the reason why Sweden is because a lot of different. No, no, not Sweden. Not Sweden. First in Belgium, they put me yeah. in a hospital room by myself. Yeah. And what happened was there was a car, a little entryway. Yeah. And the doctors were there, mm -hmm. and they spoke uh, German, even though someone else. And they said to the nurse, it's not going to last long, so oh, just be nice to the, yeah. all that. And I felt furious. I said, what the hell are they, what? I went through the war, all that, and they tell Now I understood why they gave me a room to myself, you know. I said, they, I said to myself, Oh, sons of bitches, how dare they put me on like that, right? I didn't say anything. I couldn't say anything. And then the British did something. They put Bergen Belsen on fire, and they wanted us to see it going up in flames. There would be a cure. And it was, you know, uh, summer, spring. So they opened the windows, and they moved your bed so you could see the fire. And suddenly I see a reflection of myself in the window. I said, oh my God, they're right. <laughs> this guy is going to last. Because yeah. I never saw myself like this. You were like I, down to 48. I saw myself in You were down mirror. to 48 pounds, basically? Yeah. Wow. wow. So anyway. I, but you went to another hospital then, too. No, from there, yeah. the Swedes yes. okay. took all the children they took us to Sweden. Right. And there, too, it was an amazing experience. Because Nurse Hedvig would not go home. She'd stay all night in the hospital to be next to me in case I needed anything. Again, another individual human being. Uh, I'd like to end this thing. Uh, it, it, you know, there's a camera right there if you look directly at it. Which camera? And right there. That, see that little thing up there? It's very small. This? Yeah, that right up there. I just want you to look at it and tell people something they should know about what you experienced. The most important thing they should know. The most important thing that they should know from what you've experienced. Just look right into the camera and tell them. Well, you have to know that life is cruel. And that's why the Jews, when they drink, they, even though they don't understand it, they say l'chaim to life. Mm -hmm. But it's not dancing and singing Hollywood style. It's like saying, I take you on. I take you on. Go ahead. Be, do what you want. Here, I drink to you. And I would say that it's not even anything you think of consciously. You just know that, that you don't let the cruelty get you down. And this has been, you know, spectacular. This has been just, uh, I, I, I think it's an important story people needed to hear. And uh, there's more to your life. This is just the beginning of it. The rest of your life is phenomenal. 
and the things that you did and the people you knew and the places you've been. And I hope that some other time you can come back here and we can do that part of the story because sure, sure. that's the happier part. <laughs> Maybe not the marriages, but the, the, yeah. the, the rest well, of Well, at the time I thought the marriages because yeah. in a sense I was totally screwed up about love. So. Well, we'll get into that. Thank you so much, Jack. Very well. Jack Garfine. Okay.